This Week in Startups is brought to you by Cisco Spark, Get Video Meetings, Team Messaging, Digital Whiteboarding, File Sharing, and Calling all in one secure app. Visit ciscospark.com to learn more and sign up for free. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and I am here with my lifelong BFF, Brian Alvey, who is a serial entrepreneur and uh, helped me, uh, coached me through my recent uh, book, Angel, Mm -hmm. and was my partner on Weblogs, Inc., where we created Engadget and Joystick and Autoblog, a bunch of different things. And now we can say a venture partner of the Launch Fund. Correct. Which means you will be bringing us potential uh, companies to invest in. Uh Uh-huh. You and I will talk about it. Yep. Give you a little carry. Mm-hmm. Ooh, maybe yum yum. Brian hits an Uber Could with be. JCal. I've already had people pitch me on it. Great. Uh, yeah. So we'll talk about that. Awesome. Uh, so today's episode is our great eight. Eight companies from the incubator. If you don't know, the Launch Incubator is a program that I run here with my team in San Francisco. It's a 12-week program. We meet 20 times and we have a thousand people or so apply every year and we accept eight. We do it twice a year, sometimes three. And it's sort of the anti-500 or anti-Y Combinator approach. Instead of having 50 or 60 like 500 startups or 125 or 150 like Y Combinator, we just have seven or eight companies each class. Quality, not quantity. Right. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. Which are, in your mind? Uh, Well, you're making fewer bets. So you may miss right. out on something great. You have to eliminate people. You make a lot of people of those thousand, uh, you know, sad. But sure. then you actually try them to work, you tell them to work harder and right. apply again in six months. Yeah, and we let every time we uh, tell people, hey, you didn't make it into the class, mm-hmm. we reserve 12 spots over the 12 weeks for one company to come audit. I and we those. typically invite 15 people to come audit the class, and usually two or three of them drop out. Right. Which to me speaks volumes. If you applied and you really wanted to come to the incubator, you didn't make it because the competition is so fierce, usually not a fault of the founder, just you know, limited number of spots. Right. Then to not come and audit the class is like, well, how seriously did you take it? Which is nuts because you get almost all the benefits of being in the incubator. You get to meet right. four or five investors a week. Sure. You get to hear all the pitch feedback. It's crazy. It's fantastic. Uh, And the reason we do seven or eight companies really is because what's great about doing just seven or eight companies is we get to have each company pitch every week to four or five investors, which means by the end of the program, you've, in, you've pitched your company to 50 investors and gotten feedback from 50 of them. Okay. It's quite, quite, uh, and you've been through the program twice. I've been through it twice, which is yeah. either a great thing or a really bad, bad. Well, you it's it's like, doing, like doing seventh grade twice. It's you know? basically, <laughs> I, you know, I just like hanging out with you. So oh, I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, just come no, again. That, that was good. Yeah, just come to the incubator again. Okay, so we're gonna meet eight companies. The first company, is transported. Tyson is here. And now we'll go to our wide shot. Uh, if you're not uh, watching the show and you're listening to it, this would be a good one to actually go over to YouTube or thisweekinstartups.com and check out the video. Um, Tyson looks like a huge nerd. He's in his Oculus Rift looking around the room, and he's about six foot, 15 inches tall. Right. And uh, he's got his welcome to the program, Tyson. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. And we met back in the day because I was on the board of Gordon Gould's company, This Next, and you were the product manager growth? Originally the product manager, then by the end of it, the VP of technology. So right. Kind of the whole thing. So you applied to the incubator, and we had you come for the last 12 weeks. And actually, tomorrow, Thursday, is the 12th week, and we're just reviewing everybody's pitches. So what I'd like you to do is just pitch like you do in the incubator, and uh, we'll time you. In the incubator, we give people about three minutes to pitch, mm-hmm. uh, which is sort of the trailer of your startup. Mm -hmm. And to put that in perspective, at a demo day for Y Combinator or Techstars, I think they have two minutes on stage. Right. And you do that once a year or once a semester. Right. And we do three minutes, 12 times. Every single week. Yeah, every week, and you get feedback. So it's, it's, it's a big advantage of the program is you get much better at pitching. So we'll put about three or four minutes on the clock, and we'll have you go, Tyson. Three, two, go. Awesome, thanks. So I am standing in the transported showroom, which lets us uh, see properties from around town and even around the world. I can kind of get a quick overview, and when I see one that I like, uh, I can jump right in. So let's, uh, everyone loves Beverly Hills. Let's go to Beverly Hills and check it out. And this is, just so people know, you're using the Oculus headset. Yeah, I'm using the Oculus Rift right now. 
Um, so first things first, we've landed in the driveway and I can sort of slowly check around and get a feel for what the driveway is. I can basically jump around the driveway and really sort of get a sense for the place and the space. If I want to understand a little bit more about the property, I can bring up this sort of augmented reality shortcut menu. It's a, wow, $9 million home, so pretty aspirational. I'll take it. Uh, yeah, beautiful home. Let's hope... It's a pied terre Exactly. Pied in Beverly Hills. So first things first, why don't we just do a quick shortcut in uh, Somewhere Awesome? Why don't we jump straight to the master balcony? So one of the great things about virtual reality is you're not tethered to reality. So instead of slowly wandering through the home, uh, I can jump in anywhere. So this is actually a, a really gorgeous view from up here. Let's see what it's like if I just jump right down into the backyard and take another look around. Great pool. This looks like a pretty great entertaining area here as I just sort of wander into the home. So, wow, really great. And what's interesting about this is you're jumping between the kitchen and the outdoor area, and you can look at your feet. You can zoom in on the sink. You could see if the floor is actually as good as it looks. You can look at the ceiling. Just a level of detail you wouldn't get from photos. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like I'm really here. I don't need to go to the house to know that the view is actually incredible. It's not just what the agent said. And as you said, the, the quality of the finishings is what I hope it is and all those sort of little details. And the agents lie. Um, I can tell you this. They take the photos and they doctor the photos. So many times on Socket Site or Curbed, you know, two real estate blogs I, I read religiously, they will call out the brokers who literally Photoshop the images and change the view or remove trees from the front of the house. They literally Photoshop it to make it look more appealing. Yeah, with this, there's, there's no way to do that. It's like you're really there. Mm -hmm. And the really special thing is you feel it, like you, that sort of intangible feng shui sort of feeling of what a home is like that you have to go and visit. Uh, the incredible thing about VR is it delivers it, and it delivers it really, really well in a compelling okay. way. Well, this is a great demo. Um, if you want to go see it, go to thisweekinstartups.com or go to youtube.com slash thisweekin, and you can go uh, subscribe to those channels and, and see the video there. All right, so Tyson, let's go to your pitch deck now. Look at this. Okay, so um, here we go. We're loading up on our Cisco Spark board, and we already had the file loaded there. Wow, that was so seamless. I am such a fan of the Cisco Spark board. And here you go, you've loaded your PDF of your deck on it, and you're gonna give us the uh, pitch that you would give in the incubator. So go ahead, Tyson. Awesome, so uh, we're transported, um, and we're a virtual reality platform for real estate. So whether you're buying or renting a home, uh, shopping for it can be a massive headache. Um, and the reason is that photos and videos on your phone or the web don't tell you about the things that matter. Little things like we talked about the floor in the demo, how what the quality of it is, or as the view we saw in the demo, that feel of a home that we talked about in the demo. So that's why you have to hop in your car, drive all over town, and that can take a really, really long time. Those are real numbers. Imagine instead, as we just saw, you don't have to imagine, uh, that you could use virtual reality to tour a dozen homes in person, uh, and then check out the one or two that you really loved. Um, so we saw the product demo. It's really great. Uh, everybody, please download the transported app. We're live on Oculus Rift and Gear. Let me tell you how the, the, the platform works. A transported service partner can use just about any 360 VR camera to scan a home. It then takes about 30 minutes using our authoring tool to make a tour like the one you just saw. It's actually cheaper and faster than cutting video. Uh, then with a single click, it gets published into three places. So first is it gets published to VR buying stations that we place in agents' offices, as well as loaner headsets that we give to agents. Second, it gets published as a gorgeous web tour, so you can share that on Zillow or the MLS or wherever like that. It also goes in the transported app for everyone who has a VR headset at home. So to be clear, we're a B2B business, and the great thing is we work with VR's footprint today. Because agents are a pinch point in the consumer experience, we can place VR hardware with them and get around the consumer hardware problem. Let's talk a little bit about our business. So we want to be the Zillow of VR. We think it's a $10 billion opportunity. But we're getting there in the short term by selling services. So we charge $400 to $1,200 to make tours for high-end homes. We do this because we make a nice 60% margin, but also it's because how we're growing our service provider network. We launched in January, and this is how we're doing. Uh, by this time next year, so 12 months, we'll be doing about 5,000 tours and 1.5 in revenue. So we've got a model that lets us grow nice, cash efficiently, really lean, while Moore's Law pushes VR out into everybody's living room. And VR really is a better way to buy a home. We're the number one real estate app on Oculus Rift Store already today. 
We're the number two on Samsung Gear. And if you read the reviews on the App Store, this is truly how people, consumers, really want to buy their next home. It's that great. Uh, we've got some of the best agents and also some of the best brands in the business are our customers already. Um, so yeah, we're transported. Thank you. All right. Well done. I'll give you a quick golf right. clap for that. Um, Brian, you were, uh, you, you know, you come to the incubator, even though you're not in it right now on a pretty regular basis. Um, take me through your thoughts on transported from week one or two to now, yeah, so week the, 12. So the good news is in these three months, I think I've only seen them two or three times. So on like 10 times, 12 times. So I've, I've kind of, they've grown in leaps and bounds, right? This is the hardest of all eight companies to demo because you can't just hand out VR headsets to everybody. Do I show them this? It's too jumpy when I'm standing up here, when they, the VC asks me a question and I answer yes, like the whole world is moving, right? right. Up and down, it's, it's very jarring. So this is the hardest of all the things to demo. Uh, and it's come a long way, this is fantastic. I have no bad feedback. All the things that people asked the couple of times when I was in there, he just kind of casually goes, oh yeah, Moore's Law is on our team. Um, it's gonna push out hardware to everybody. It's basically one of our team members and uh, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome. Like the whole v, the whole problem of VR not being so widely adopted just kind of gets And this rolled. is a key uh, aspect of the incubator, Tyson, that maybe you could talk about, which is we, um, have the fa we have the investors who come each week give you feedback. You collected that feedback after the first three or four weeks. It was a little demoralizing, perhaps, but I think that that feedback made you really crisp in presenting your idea. So talk about some of that early feedback you got and then how you made that transition to anticipating and including the objections in your deck. Yeah, so, and, and I wouldn't actually say it was demoralizing. In some ways, it's, uh, in, it, it puts fire in your belly because you realize why can't they see the future I see? And at first you think it's because people are dumb, but you hear it three or four times from very smart people and you realize y y y like you're the problem, right? You're not convincing them of the, fu the possible future that you want to create. So that's the first lesson. And this is even the amongst the world's greatest investors. I exactly. In, in this town, right? The most forward-looking town, probably the most forward-looking people, they don't see the same future you do. Uh, and it takes a while before you get it through your head. That's not their fault, that's your fault. Right, it's your um, job as the founder, the entrepreneur, to bring the investor or a potential employee or a potential partner uh, or a customer in your case, like Sotheby's, it's your job to actually make them understand why this is important, not their job to understand what's in your head. Exactly, and it can seem incredibly obvious to you. And it, I mean, I think it kind of has to be as an entrepreneur to put everything you have into it, uh, but you also have a sixth goal. So it takes a whole bunch of people telling you they don't see it before uh, it kind of sinks in. Um, so that was the first part of that experience. Um, and then when you open your mind to that reality, um, then you can just listen, write everything down, and just iterate, iterate. It's like product. If you treat it like product. Uh, the pitching. You, the pitching like product. You have your signal, uh, and you just iterate, 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 iterate on it. So we're, And now when you give a presentation, people say, I don't have any questions. How much are you raising? Yes, exactly. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really a funny thing to see. And I remember you promised this to us in the first week that uh, by week 12, uh, all the companies would stand up and they would be done and then the invest everybody would be quiet and maybe some people would mic drop or maybe they wouldn't um, but then the investors kind of make up not really interesting softball questions just to say something right. uh, but there's no questions uh, everyone's nailed it uh, so it was a really great thing to see yeah it is part of the experience which is in the early weeks because you haven't pitched over and over and over again you, you're now um, so good at it you anticipate so many of the objections the reasons why a VC might not invest or an angel might not invest, and you incorporate them into your deck that when they're done, they're like, hmm, what questions should I ask? Um, what's your background? Right. What's next? You get Where are you going right. with that? You, you all of a sudden are not debating if this is gonna succeed or if it's a good idea. You've established, hey, there is, some, there is a market here, there is a solution here, there's a product that people love, and now we just have to decide, do you want to invest how much is it in your kill zone? Do you like us? What, and what if, can you add? What can you add as an investor? And if you're not going to invest, you know, that's okay. When should we contact you again with our progress and our updates? Mm -hmm. um, I love that he said that the, the pitch itself is the product you're working on. Because I preach storytelling all the time, and that kind of helps me frame it better, which is you do have your product, you do have your startup, but this actual storytelling thing is a product. Treat it like a product. 
Yeah, it's a great piece of advice, and I'll, I'll be stealing that from you. Tyson, uh, any thoughts on the program? Now, we're here in the uh, week 12. Tomorrow, we're going to go and make a site visit. We're going to actually visit Sequoia Capital, the number one venture capital firm in the history of Silicon Valley. And we're going to meet with Social Capital, um, considered the most up-and-coming right. uh, of the new crop of venture firms. What's your excitement level? How do you look back on these uh, 11, 12 weeks? What are your thoughts on it? H how has it changed you as an entrepreneur and the company's trajectory? <clears throat> wow, lots of, lots of big questions there. Yeah. Uh, so we're very excited about it, right? Like, like anything, when you're going into it, especially an incubator that has some costs yeah. is associated with it. Uh, the you, cost being we're investing at a very low valuation. Exactly. So you have to get value from it. And, and it's also the time, right? So it's like the two things you have the, the, the most precious things in the world to an entrepreneur, your equity and your time. Uh, you're we're taking both. You're giving them both, right? Yeah. Um, and so it starts with uh, fear and greed, right? The, yeah. the eternal battle between those two things. Um, and so, I mean, what I can say now in retrospect is that it, it taught, it, the things I thought it would teach me it didn't, and the things I didn't understand it would teach me it did. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some ways, that's the greatest possibility, right? right. Um, is when, so for me personally, um, I would say, and I think any company goes through is gonna take away different things. Uh, you're gonna get access. Uh, you're going to get great advice from Jason. You're going to get great advice from Brian. You're going to get great advice from everybody who visits. And everyone's going to roughly get the same thing, right? Um, I think every individual company and every individual uh, entrepreneur is going to take also something sort of special and different. What I can tell you about me, what I learned, um, basically, uh, you know, I'm a technical person. My background is technical. I'm an engineer. Um, and so you don't want to believe in, uh, in some, sometimes you don't want to believe in the value of storytelling. Like you believe in the existence of truth. Um, and so everybody should see truth because it's true. And so it, does, it shouldn't matter how you talk about it because right. it's true. Um, and you really, and again, in a very product technical centered way, you, you, you see how that hypothesis is wrong week after week. Right. Um, you want to believe that people don't judge books by their cover. And then you realize people literally buy books because they like the cover. I exactly. Exactly. And, and you don't need to sell truth to people. But you can have truth that doesn't get sold and nobody ever learns it, right? Exactly. That's, that's pretty funny. Yeah, no, exactly right. So for me personally, um, one, the, the sort of the heartfelt realization of that was one of the biggest takeaways. Oh, very transformative. And then the second side of it was then uh, the skills to tell stories well. Well, um, I'm happy so. to have broken your heart to the harsh <laughs> reality that people are incredibly vapid and judge books by their cover. If you could go back in time, and here's a really risky question for me to ask, Brian. If you could go back in time, take your equity back, give me back the money I invested, and not do the program, if you had that ability, would you do it? Uh, no. 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 How likely are you to tell another founder who was going to come to this to do it? What would you tell uh, if Brian was calling, was a first-time founder or a second-time founder? What would you tell him would be the reasons to do it? I'm curious. So, I mean, I think, I think it really goes down to those two things. So one, just access. And so uh, different founders may or may not have be a good fit, right? Mm -hmm. For the com Different companies just might not be a fit for the audience. Sure. Uh, the audience being just the investors you have and you and the connections that we kind of make through that thing. Um, so if you want to evaluate whether it's for you, you got to look at two things. One, does the audience matter to your company? Because it may or may not. Um, but then it's sort of the second part of it is, um, do you want to learn all the other skills, right? Mm -hmm. So... For, like I said, for me, the biggest skill was storytelling and all that kind of stuff that I could take, even if, so for me, it was personally a good fit, like it was the right audience, but I, I think you could do it taking away either one of those things and still derive Enough value, value yeah. out of the very Was expensive. there a speaker, because we have a speaker as well, we didn't <laughs> yep. even get into that, but every week we have a speaker and we have jam sessions. Was there a jam session speaker or a weekly speaker that you just said, wow, this really changed my worldview and that I, I learned a lot from, took a lot of notes? Um, yeah, so there, there's a bunch of them, uh, and for really different reasons. So for just nerdy sort of uh, talking shop, uh, and I'm going to think of Butcher's name, but Des Trainer. Des Trainer, of Des course, Trainer. from Intercom. Yeah, from Intercom. Co-founder so of Intercom. Yeah, so he, he, gave, he gave sort of a very how to be a product executive, right? So mm -hmm. how, to, how to look at product as an executive, how to manage product, how to create a culture around product, um, and just having been someone who's come up through the product side of things. Um, and just sort of seeing what incredible, like high level executive leadership and product is and how you think about it and how you grow a company around a great product. So again, Fantastic. very talking shop. That was, yeah. All right. We uh, wish you continued success and I'll look Thank forward to so seeing much. you tomorrow for our uh, Sand Hill Road tour. Yeah, the pilgrimage. Awesome. Okay, next up, we'll have FitBot in a moment. 
Hey, everybody. I'm super excited about our latest partner on This Week in Startups. It's called Cisco Spark. From Cisco. You know Cisco. Of course you know Cisco. Cisco Spark is a new meeting platform and a communication platform for teams. And we're using it here at This Week in Startups, and it is life-changing. It can make working together so easy, so pleasant. And in this package... For one low price of free, you get, yes, that's right, free, you get video meetings, team messaging, like chat, you know how that works, digital whiteboarding, and we're going to get into that in a minute, file sharing and calling, all of this together in one secure app that works on any of your devices, Android, tablet, iPad, iPhone, desktop, you get the idea, and it's the fastest way to host and join meetings, and it works with industry-leading video systems like Ah, yes, the Cisco Spark Board. I have the Cisco Spark Board, and this is a touch-based, all-in-one device where literally I click and I say, everybody who's in this room, you know, like a chat room, everybody in this Cisco Spark room, I want you to join this video conference. Somebody could be at home, another person could be in a hotel or on the road, on their phone, on the BART. Two people could be in a New York office, two people could be in the San Francisco office. All of a sudden, we're all in one space, on the Cisco Spark board with all of our files from that chat room. And we can then pick an image like we did for the launch festival and start drawing on it and saying, hey, let's move these tables here. It is amazing. And the Cisco Spark board comes in 55 inches or 70 inches. It's kind of like an all-in-one touchscreen whiteboard camera with amazing microphones where if you're in the back of the room, it picks you up perfectly. And the video quality, it makes you feel like you're in the same room without having to spend what used to be, I think, a quarter million dollars or $50,000 to outfit a room. You can now do it for low thousands of dollars. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I love my Cisco Spark Board. And on this very program, This Week in Startups, we're going to start putting Cisco Spark Boards in other cities so that entrepreneurs and investors from, say, New York, Los Angeles, maybe London, Berlin, uh, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Seoul, can then video conference into the show, and we can start doing remotes with startups from around the world. How exciting is that? All powered by Cisco Spark and the Cisco Spark board. If you want to see all this exciting stuff and try the software, go to ciscospark.com, ciscospark.com to learn more and sign up for free. Thanks for joining the team, Cisco. Let's get back to this amazing program. Okay, welcome back to This Week in Startups. Thanks to our friends at Cisco for making the Spark board and lots of great tools that we use here at launch. I am here with venture partner and uh, founder of Clipisode. Is it Clipisodes or Clipisode? No S. No S. Clipisode. Uh, Brian Alvey, uh, who's been through the incubator, and uh, we just sort of transported. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. And next up is Excellent. Fitbod. And so uh, we're going to have another company, uh, another startup that went through the incubator, pitch just like they do at the incubator, and uh, we'll give them some feedback afterwards. So welcome. Uh, you have three minutes on the clock. Three, two, go. Thank you, Jason. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Jesse, I'm Alan, and we're FitBod. FitBod builds personalized strength training routines from retract workout data. Let's see how it works. This is Jack and Irene. They used to pay personal trainers $100 an hour. This personal trainer taught them form, kept them motivated, and most importantly, prescribed an individualized workout routine. But now they have FitBod for $7 a month. Let's dive in. This is Jack's recommended workout for the day. He's traveling for work, and he only has dumbbells. No problem. He taps into his elite settings and sets his available equipment, and FitBot's linear optimizer will recalculate his workout given only the equipment he has available. Jack starts his workout and taps into the first exercise and sees the recommended sets, reps, and weight that he should perform. Using his Apple Watch, he can log the first set, and see the optimal rest time before beginning the next set. While resting, Jack wants to brush up on his form, so he taps into our HD exercise video instructions. Jack can complete the exercise and finish the workout. And here, Fitball will show him all of his past workouts and the muscle groups he has engaged. Fitball will then assign a fatigue value to each of his core muscle groups, shown here on a body heat map, that recovers following a linear regression. Finally, Fitball will calculate his next best workout. Let's see what's going on under the hood. So as we just saw, Fitball uses Jack's tracked exercise data to calculate his workout. The workout also reflects his individual preferences, his gym equipment, 
his fitness goal, his schedule. Most importantly, FitBot utilizes the best practices of exercise science, using time-tested formulas and theories like non-linear periodization and muscle confusion. The brains is a machine learning algorithm, and the result is a fully customized workout, personalized down to the set, rep, and weight that gets better over time. Eight million people pay personal trainers $10 billion a year to do this. Our market is bigger. We can provide the same expert fitness guidance to 23 million gym goers and 58 million Americans who pay for a gym. Our one key stat is daily exercises logged. It's growing 27% month over month. We're hitting all time highs each week, surpassing 20,000 exercises per day. Our users love us. We have 3,800 people paying for FitBot. Last week, we introduced Apple's in-app ratings request, and since then, we've received over 1,400 reviews. Almost all of them are five stars. Going forward, our growth projects will tap into social distribution. We're gonna let Jack and Irene work out together and compete against each other. Thank you, we're FitBot. All right, well done. And I just want to say, excellent use of the spark board there. Uh, that, that was the, the first point. I, I feel bad for a founder to say like, wow, you're really great at smart board, right? But that was my, that was my first thing. He's, well, uh, when you zoom in on a desktop presentation or a video or something, it looks dorky. You have the little mouse tracking thing. You got to zoom in and it like, you zoom when you're, too much. When you're on your laptop. Right, on your laptop or something. But this, on this board, he just reaches up and touches it. And he's like, and look, we have 1,401 reviews. It's the world's biggest iPad. Yes, it's it unbelievable. Crazy. The Cisco was, spark really board cool. is like you flip through this presentation deck and zoomed in, zoomed out for the right. people who are listening Showed on audio. Form. And it, and then you were switching back and forth from a PDF to video and to the to um, an app on a to phone. the app on the phone. It was amazing. Right, and it really was well done. Very easy to use. I was able to zoom in exactly to the point. And I it looks to. like you've had a year of training, but you probably just walked up to this today. Right? Just new. Just okay, learned good. it today. Great. Just learned it today. And All right. What's great about the Cisco Spark Board um, is uh, we're going to be using them here on this week in startups to have founders from other countries uh. and cities uh, at co-working spaces. Sure. We're looking for a co-working partner. Right. I'm not sure who that will be. We'll find out if there's a co-working space on a global basis who wants to partner with us. Uh, but we're going to be pulling in investors and founders from around the world mm -hmm. to pitch us and use the Sparkboard in their city. And we'll actually have that high fidelity pitching from around the world, which we did in the early days of This Week in Startups, but the technology really wasn't there. Sparkboard yeah, didn't exist. These screens are, just, I mean, they're perfect. They're demented. Yeah, they're demented. Um, and, uh, okay, so Brian, uh, when you look at something like FitBod, I think everybody thinks apps are over. Mm -hmm. and the fitness space is too crowded. Right. But we learned something different over time in the incubator. Uh, what are your thoughts on FitBot and how they address those issues? Yeah, I can, I can tell you from week one, right, the, the first thing everybody thinks is crowded space, right? If I want to learn how to build an app, you say, well, what are you going to build just for a test project? Uh, a fitness tracker, right, a workout tracker. It's just what you do. So there's tons of these. Um, my biggest concern isn't actually the crowded space. It's I have a trainer I pay for because – it forces me to show up. It, it motivates me. There's that sort of pressure to do that. So I don't remember you saying this early on in week one, but you clearly at the end said, oh, we're going to add fitness partners, challenges. You and a friend can make a pact like you have your steps yeah. uh, pact, Jason, with your friends. Well, it's actually like, a bet, but yes. Uh, okay, yeah, I was trying to, yeah, it's, it's a bet. It's more degenerate than a pact. No, correct. But let's call it a pact where if you don't do your number of steps, you pay the you other person pay the other $2,000. Person. And, or you can double it the next day or, you're, or you have to pay them. So, so there's this whole thing to it. And having that person to keep you accountable, having that, you know, that challenge, the leaderboard type aspect uh, is fantastic. So that's really, that was my only concern. Like I wouldn't use this because I won't have somebody hounding me to get this done. That's why I'd rather pay somebody. But if I can get that through the app and save all that money, this is fantastic. And this was a big part of me accepting you into the incubator, which was as somebody who as the earliest stage investor, my job, and as an incubator, um, as the head of the incubator, I have to see when I should take a chance and squint a little bit and say, well, if they solve these three or four things, if these, in other words, if these three or four things go right, this could become a juggernaut. And what was very interesting for me when I met FitBod was I had been an investor in com.com when nobody believed in it and right. they were charging, I think, 10 bucks a year. Now they charge 10 bucks a month. Everybody I know is using it. And I, I can't say the amount of revenue, but it's- it, It's a hit. I see it everywhere. It's staggering. Right. It's staggering. They're in the top 100 of paid apps. They're making money hand over fist and it's a very small 
operation still. So it's massively profitable and it's going to wind up being, I think, one of my top five investments after nice. Uber, Robinhood, Wealthfront, uh, and Thumbtack. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be like the fifth uh, and who knows if it will catch up to any of those. So I saw that in FitBod and I also saw two founders who were incredibly cash efficient. It was just two of you and you're also... Um, Passionate. So you, if you're listening to the podcast right now, you can't see, but the, the founders are in incredible shape and they're obviously lifting weights. And I thought, gosh, this is, these are people who actually care and have been building this for some amount of time and have a core group of people. This is what differentiated with you and got you into the incubator. So let's talk about this key issue that kept coming up, which is it's a crowded space. How did you guys learn to handle that criticism, which happened literally every week? and with every other investor. 25 of 50 investors probably brought it up. Yeah, it's a great point, and I think Brian brought up and spoke about it a little bit as well. It's a very crowded space. We think none of them really provide the true utility of a great workout that a personal trainer will provide. And so that's why we started at the very top. We got individuals a great workout. We can easily move downstream, add motivation, add social and your friends aspects to keep you accountable and allow you to post your accomplishments to make sure that we reach that growth that we'd like to reach, giving everyone a great workout. And that's the interesting part is you're using machine learning and some data science and looking at what people have done already in the app to give them their next set of workouts. And that's a very hard thing to communicate to people who are uh, have been burned by investing in three or four fitness apps or having friends who've invested in them and not one, they, they think, oh, well, this has been done before. But what they don't realize is that how you do something and how, you, uh, how well you do something can be the big difference. If something is ranked by consumers as a seven or an eight in terms of how likely they are in that promoter score to tell their friends, guess what? That is scored as indifferent. A seven or eight on the scale is indifferent. If you get into the nine, 10, which say Calm or Uber or Thumbtack, uh, or Wealthfront, or Robin, and all of those companies, and Tesla and Apple, all have nines and tens when people mm -hmm. say, how likely are you to recommend this product to one of your friends? I really believe FitBot is in that nine, 10 category because if you use it, and I used it, you really can't shut up about it because it really does work that much better, which it really speaks to craftsmanship mm -hmm. and being a craftsperson and really having uh, a not stopping iterating when you're 70 or 80%. Having a seven or eight out of 10 means people will be indifferent, but having a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, which I think you accomplished on your own, cash efficiently, makes it viral. Has that been your experience? Yeah, definitely. So that was our real focus, was getting our users to love us. And that's not what like. we- Not like, to love. We, we were really careful about responding to each feedback email individually to to understand our project roadmap, to put in everything that they want. How long did it take for you to listen to people and how many months and what month did it tip over from like to love? Oh, we're still doing it. I mean, we're, we're not okay, stopping. Okay, but with, with some group feedback. of people, when do you feel it happened? How many months of iteration did it take to have the majority of people using it, you know, paid people to say, hey, you know what? I, I love this. I don't just like it. I'm not giving it a seven or eight, but we start seeing those nines and tens. To be honest, you speak of craftsmanship and craftspersonship, and Jetsy, I think, is an amazing designer. He created an amazing app. So right off the bat, we had people that said they loved it. And the every look email, and feel was very nice. Very nice. And every email that we received was, I love this app. I wish it did something else. Ah. And that's how we were able to understand what features we needed to incorporate into the app. I can explain this to people, Brian. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a husband or a wife, your spouse, Mm -hmm. to another person, you could fall in love together and you can get married. But that's really where the work begins at becoming a great spouse is to really think, hey, how could I be a better spouse? How can I be more supportive of this person? How can I be more empathetic? How can I listen more? I feel like it's something you and I have gotten in our friendship uh, over the years, which is we were f always friends, but we, we deepen that friendship over time. Absolutely. So when I go home and Nikki says, how was the show today? I'm going to say Jason gave me marriage advice, first off. Like, she's going to be very excited about that. Sure. Um, she's not going to be excited about that. But uh, no, it's, 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 it's funny, the, the, the like and the love. I, I'm actually curious, when did you add that social thing? Was that something you came into the incubator with? Or was that feedback you got in the last 12 weeks and said, I'm going to add this feature? I'm just curious. So we haven't added social just no, yet, uh, but, but, but we when will. When did you put it on your roadmap? 
Was that uh, something that came up during the incubator? It came up years ago? No, no. It came up from a long time ago. People okay. have been asking for workout partners. They've also been asking to be able to share their accomplishments with their friends. And so it's something that has been there for a long time. We think right now that we have built a great product will be the right time to inflect this and to inflect the growth to make sure that more people are able to use it. And for me, when I saw that, I, I said to myself, this is like a great starting hand in poker, right? Mm -hmm. They've got ace queen suited. It's not the perfect hand. It's not aces, kings, or queens, right? Mm -hmm. I would much prefer to play those cards or ace, king suited. But they got ace, queen suited. It's a pretty good starting hand. Mm -hmm. maybe, we should, maybe I should make a bet. And what I thought to myself was, well, what if this hand improves on the flop, right? So this is what I think as a, as a gambler, as a better who does it for a living. You both stay in for that first round and see how it goes. Let me see what right. happens because if they do figure out the, if they do figure out, if they've got ace, queen of hearts, if they do figure out social, I believe, that's sort of like them hitting two hearts two on the flop hearts, correct. and the ace. Mm -hmm. So now they've got top pair right. and a flush draw. Mm -hmm. And let's say two of the cards they hit were, you know, uh, you know, the, the king of hearts and the, and the jack or the ten of hearts. Oh, oh sure. my God, now they've got a chance of a royal potential. flush or yes. they got straight possibilities. It's a very textured thing. So when mm -hmm. I look at your company, I say, God, there's so many possibilities for you to improve this hand. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been super exciting. Now, talk a little bit about um, how the funding uh, process has been for you. We, we don't want to talk about if you're raising or not. We don't want to trigger anything. But just talking in general, in talking to investors, not about fundraising, but just their enthusiasm for the product, almost universally, people would not take a meeting for a fitness app today, just like they wouldn't take a photo sharing app or a dating right. app uh, meeting. But have you gotten follow-up meetings with investors? Have people shown interest in your company and its future? Yes, yes, we have. And, and I think investors love to see the traction. They love to see that we bootstrap this product from two people, $4,000 total invested in the company from ourselves to getting to mm -hmm. profitability with great traction, great product, and users that obviously love us. So we kind of compel them to take that meeting with us, even if in the back of their brains, they initially thought this is just a fitness company. Right, and this is a, you know, one of the challenges as founders, isn't it, Brian? You, know, you, you come into a space, the well's been poisoned, or there's a lot of you know, um, shrapnel and a lot of body parts laying around, it's pretty gruesome, mm -hmm. all these zombie companies, it's the graveyard of startups, all these fitness apps, all these photo apps, all these dating apps, all these on-demand companies have failed. And you're into, in the space and having success. Right. And you now have to convince investors that all of the carcasses along the road that they see of dead startups, yeah. they should ignore because, hey, when you get over this hill, that's where the promised land is and we're ready. So I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I do because I'm living this right now, right? With so I, I, I have a, it's a social video app, make videos with people. It's, I'm not the first person to do this. Three years ago, there was a wave of these. Vine. So, uh, well, even beside, well, so Vine wasn't still collaborative. It, it, was, it was all these jump cam, weave. Uh, oh, yes. Facebook had an app called Riff. Right. right. There were, I'd say, 30 of these things that were popular. Some got 3 million in funding, some got more, and a whole bunch of them were out there. They all went through incubators. Some of the incubators, like the Disney one, doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. So I just take this head on. I put a slide in my deck that says, this, is, this has been tried. I'm not the first one. So either you already know these companies, and I'm confirming what you already know, and I'm showing that I'm not afraid of this information, or you've never heard of any of these companies. You go, oh, my God, this guy's done his research. He's right. listed you're, 30 you're of these credibility. things. And he's shown all the money they've raised. Then I go and I explain, here's the one thing all of them did that was wrong. None of them realizes what doomed them. I'm doing the opposite. Right. Now let me show you how this works. And in this case, it's a tool that you can export, the, I'm guessing here, but it's the ability no, it's, to put it on any platform. No, I don't, I don't, you don't force everybody else to download an app. Ah, so that's really it. That's we're, doing, we're doing this really heavy lifting hard thing. Yeah, so if somebody everybody posts else, a video, I can reply to the video correct. without the app, so it's, right. it's fluid. But the point is, like Fitbod, right? This, is a, this, this has been tried before. Right. And you're going to have that skepticism right off the bat. Yeah. So just dive straight into that. Slide one. I'm not the first person to do this but I'm doing it better. They all did it wrong. Here's how they did it wrong. Here's what we're doing right. And as an angel investor, this is where having experience backing companies that are in unpopular spaces and untrendy at the time, you learn that over time. So you say, hey, wait a second. I know that everybody is sour on dating. I know everybody's right. sour on on-demand. I know they're sour on photo sharing apps. However, 
I'm looking at a set of founders who are unique in this way, who have a different approach, and who will figure it out. This is the same thing that happened with YouTube and Google, two of the greatest investments, right. both done by Sequoia Capital, by the way, mm -hmm. who will be visiting tomorrow with this incubator class to go see Rulof Botha, who did the YouTube investment. Right. And sometimes the 10th or 20th, you know, I think most people say Google was the 11th search right. engine, 10th, 11th back, venture back search engine of We could name, if we tried, we could name 10 other popular, well used search engines back Lycos, in the day. Excite, Magellan, Yahoo, Yahoo uh, Alta Vista. Alta Vista. Right? There's a lot of these. Yeah. Uh, Inktomi, right? Inktomi, right? So sure. there, there were, I mean, we're old. So we remember these 10 other ones. Yeah. But they were established big companies that were buying other companies, looked like they were indestructible. You know, maybe they're fighting each other for market share. And Google came through, and people remember none of those. Sure. So, All right. Uh, the victors get to write history. They do. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you guys. I think you're going to have uh, great success. If you look back in your time on the incubator, what would you say were, you know, the key takeaways for you that provided the most value? Because coming into it, you didn't need to do the incubator. You were bootstrapping, and you had sweat equity. Two of my favorite things, by the way, in mm -hmm. founders, and we talk about this in the book Angel, mm -hmm. coming out July 18th, that bootstrapped founders and sweat equity founders are the best founders because you know that if they run out of money, they've been in that situation before where they had no money, so they keep growing the business. Right. I love, love, love bootstrapped sweat equity founders because they're not going to come crying to you they, that they ran out of money. They, they just keep don't going give like up you. easily. They don't give up easily. Right. So why did you do the incubator? And, and, and you can be candid here. And how did it, match your expectations. What things were better than you expected, less than you expected, or different and otherwise. And just be as candid as you can because I really want to improve the incubator over time. And I also want folks who are watching, who are thinking about coming to the incubator, just know the reality of coming and being part of a seven or eight person class for eight weeks, 12 weeks here in Silicon Valley. Yeah, thank you, Jason. The, the past almost 12 weeks uh, have been amazing. Um, coming into it, uh, basically my thought process was that Jesse and I created a product I was just saying, we are bootstrapped, we are successful and profitable, and we didn't need to do it. But if I had the choice, I would 100% do it one more time. And the reason why is because we can create a product. We have, we're first time founders, we've never given a pitch before, we've never fundraised before, we've never grown a company before. And week in and week out, every single week in the incubator, we are up there giving our pitch to real investors that we meet with after the pitch. And so we've really gone to become, uh, I want to say very good, I would say pro level at pitching through the incubator, through the practice that we get and the feedback we get and the insight we get from Jason. The feedback has been tremendous for your company specifically. I mean, people have given you really an idea of what they think the, the top objections are and you've learned how to answer those questions. Oh yes, yes, totally. The, the Q&A part has been, uh, I don't want to look back at my first week, but I think I personally and Jesse as well have improved tremendously through the 12 weeks. It's been a crazy learning process for us. All right, listen, it's been amazing to work with you. I'm very uh, happy to be in business with FitBod and the two of you. You've worked incredibly hard in the incubator, and I think that you're going to um, ret provide a tremendous return to the launch fund, which is important so we can continue to do our work investing in founders. Um, but I think you're going to really build a meaningful company, a, a truly meaningful company that will have $10 million in revenue very quickly. Because I've seen this movie before where you know thousands of dollars in revenue turns into tens of thousands to hundreds hundreds of thousands, and all of a sudden you start having millions a year. I think you're going to have an incredible run over the next 24 months. Uh, so thanks for coming in and presenting. Yeah, we'll be working hard, so thank okay. you. Okay. All right, Brian, we saw two great companies, Transported, doing VR for real estate, right. super promising, and we saw FitBod doing customized workouts with machine, machine learning, learning for people who are into weightlifting and that kind of stuff. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you have a favorite? I mean, of I the, hate to pick favorites, of, of but those of those two? two, if I gave you a million dollars to invest, how would you allocate it? Wow. Okay, great. So if it wasn't my money, that helps. That yeah. actually helps a lot. Um, you know, I mean, I got to pick, I got to tell one I'm not picking them. So No, that's why I give you a million dollars. You could do 600, oh, I 400. Allocate, allocate it however you like. Correct. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for saying that too. So um, uh, two thirds transported, one third Fitbod. It's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. What's your reasoning behind that? I have a specific reason that I yeah. would allocate that way. I might have the same reason as you. We'll see. So the the reason is because I think Fitbod can get to a certain level. I think it can it can conquer an interesting space. 
Uh, I think it'll be a certain amount of adoption. I think people will still use personal trainers, right? If you're a Hollywood celebrity, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to let an app tell you what to do. You're still going to hire somebody and you're going to make them wait okay. while you're, you know, doing your other stuff, right? Uh, but I think that if Transported nails it, they will have a huge, huge, huge opportunity to be the, you know, Zillow for VR, that kind of thing. Right. So basically you're looking at the potential outcome Correct. and saying Transported could be a billion dollar company. Right which means they would have to have, let's say, 100 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. In other words, $8 billion a month in revenue. You start thinking right. about that, that means- When you work backwards, it becomes reasonable and rational. $30,000 a day in revenue. you light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And you think that's achievable. And which one would you rather have the bigger stake in? The one that's going to be the bigger- No, it's company. more, it's $300,000 a day, I take it back. Yeah. So if you were gonna look at these two and you said, hey, which one could make you know, 800,000 a month, mm -hmm. which is 9.6, million dollars a year, right. you'd say FitBod. Pretty yeah. reasonable. Yeah. Pretty reasonable for them to get there because right. if they did make 800000 a month and they were charging $8 a mm -hmm. month, you start to say, the oh. social stuff catches on. There are contests. Just 100,000. All you need is 100,000 people to use right. this. Right. There's 100,000 people who will spend eight, nine, 10 bucks a month on Correct. this and they'll, they'll cruise right into that $10 million. Right. If you're going to value a company, a company with $10 million in revenue might go for 10x the top line revenue. Mm -hmm. It might have a business like that might have a 50% margin, a 60% margin. In other words, if they had 10 million in revenue, 6 million of its profits, 5 million's profits, sure. 4 million's profits, something in that range. And that might go for 25 times right. earnings or 10 times the top line or five times the top line. So if they did have $4 million, I look at, okay, back of the envelope math, 10 million in revenue, 4 million in profits, 4 million times 25. Mm -hmm be a hundred million dollars. I could see that being a hundred right. million dollar exit. Now you look at something like Transported. Hey, whoa, hold on a second. They're not just getting $8 subscriptions. They've got homes. The average home on a platform like that might be a million dollar home right. because it's for the high end homes that would do VR. You don't need a VR of a dumpy place, right? right. A studio apartment Correct. doesn't really need a VR or if it's a really There's horrible no, no home. Yard, no pool. I mean, yeah, the, it, it, it kind of works saw, in a certain circumstance. It's, it's glorious in these Beverly sure. Hills palaces, right? Right. Yeah. Imagine it's like a dumpy track house that somebody <laughs> lived in for 50 they, years and it's should, dilapidated. They should throw in some of those. I think actually it would be worthwhile though, because if you were a developer mm -hmm. who w was a house flipper, right. you're actually looking for the junky houses that somebody lived in for 40 That's years, funny. 30 years, right. didn't maintain. So you mm -hmm. can go in and say, you know what? Rip out the kitchen, right. redo the, the bathrooms. Potential. You strip it right. down to the beams, sand the floor, and we're good. Mm -hmm. We can make money on this with the flip. Right. But yeah, you could see transported hitting eight million a month in revenue. Right. Because they follow the money. I mean, well, if it was costing eight hundred dollars per home to put a home online, mm -hmm. you start putting ten thousand homes online. Okay, now we're talking. Right. You know, eight hundred dollars a home at a thousand homes online a month. Eight hundred thousand a month. Right. Okay. Ten thousand homes online a month. Eight million a month, okay. Uh -huh. Now we're starting to talk, let alone uh, like, commissions. Well, I like that both of these tap into some things people are already spending on, right? So in real estate, they're already spending uh, to do web tours and, and 360 videos and some sort of like- There's a lot of money smaller at stake. And, and on the fitness side, people are spending a on- A lot this. of money so on stake. Both of them have a very compelling case for, I can divert a portion or all of that money into something new and unique. And what's interesting about it is when you have a very clear revenue stream out there, mm -hmm. commissions when you're selling homes and the amount of money that brokers spend to get that commission, right? That, so that's a big number sitting there. Then charging them 800 to put their home in VR seems like seems nothing. Seems cheap, yes. For a $9 it million seems, dollar house. Seems too little, yes. Seems too little. Right. I mean, some of these $9 million houses are producing movies for them. Right. Or these $90 million homes, they produce movies and they send drones over. And you know they they'll custom do custom URL whole website big thing yeah yeah they're yeah. talking about spending a right. hundred thousand dollars and then another hundred thousand on marketing it by buying advertisements and stuff like that mm -hmm. so they're 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 spe they're used to spending big money and then with fitness if I'm if you use your trainer once a week every other week uh, twice a week twice thanks. a week thanks yeah seventy five yeah. bucks a pop right something in that range yeah hundred fifty a week right no it adds up the monthly seven thousand dollars a year you're yeah. probably spending it's but right. you look great thanks. You look fit. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Happy for you. Thanks. Me, I'm using the $8 a month. I'm saving the... I'm going to give them 100 bucks a year and you give the 7000 to your personal trainer. Right. right. Here's the thing I don't like about the personal trainer. I've got to be personal about this. I'm always late to everything because I got a very crazy life. Yes. I hate being late. I hate canceling. The trainers, with the exception of one trainer I have now, who I use once in a while, 
they're very uh, persnickety, and perhaps rightfully so, about their schedules, people oh, being yeah. late, and then they give you a speech, or you cancel same day, or day before they give you a speech. Like, I'm, my life's way too dynamic to, right? you know. Yeah, so, so I'm late every single time. When oh, I, really? When I, like 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 yeah. minutes. I never get that time back, but I don't miss them hmm. because there's a guy there. Yeah. So I, I you don't, need I, that. I don't like, yeah, I do need that. I need to but, gamble. Right now I'm right. in a five-time-a-week bet with my friend. Mm -hmm. We do five workouts a week. We SMS the workout to each other and okay. the results of it. And, um, yeah, it's honor system, but, right. you know, like, you really can't cheat on it. It would be just cheating yourself. But sure. I need that, like the bet. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. All right, so we start two great companies. Uh, and I think people probably learned a lot about the program. Right. As somebody who went through it two times and now is working with me to find companies, you're helping me find companies for the incubator and you're helping me find Correct. companies to invest in. And then you and I split that carry mm -hmm. is how it works. For people who don't know what a carry is, if Brian and I were to invest 500000 in a company of other people's money, our LPs, our limited partners, uh, we would get 20% of the return. So if that 500 turned into, let's say, 1.5, the right. game would be 1 million. You and I would get 20% of the gain, which would be 200,000, and we'd split it 100,000 each. Because we're investing our time, and we're sourcing the deals, yeah, the effort. and we're managing the entire process, we're getting rid of all the risk. And uh, managing not, those companies for 10 years. But we don't have to put in the same cash. Right. That's called a carry in that's our business. all the syndicates work. And if, you have one point, if we just triple the investment, mm -hmm. that's fine. But if we went 20x, right. now we're talking about a $10 million gain. Right. If it went from 1.5 to 15, you take out the original 500, you have 14.5 million. Let's say it was 15.5. Right, exactly. It, <laughs> that's uh, good to make the math easy. It turned into, you have 15 million left. We get 20% of 15. Mm -hmm. Oh, yum, yum, $3 million. Right. You and I split it, right. 1.5 million each. Now you know why people want to be investors. Right. Um, so given your knowledge of that, how do you look at the incubator? How do you look at investing in these companies uh, and the program and what's good about the program? What needs to improve? Because, you know, we are, we've done five classes. You were in two of the five. You know, what have we gotten right? And are we starting to hit our stride as a program? Because, you know, it takes a little time. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So we've gotten, a, it, it, it's gotten better every single time, right? So I have lifelong friends from the first one. Uh, not as many from the third time, the, the, the second one I went through. Uh, but I can say that the quality of these and everybody, people come from the first one, they sit in on the fifth, and they just look around like, oh my gosh, it's kind of like you know high school people watching NBA players. They're like, wow, we were never this tall and strong and yep. amazing and wow. I mean, the companies are so much, they're further along than we are and we have a two-year head start on them. Right. right? That's pretty crazy. Um, so they've definitely gotten better each time. I think you've also gotten better at finding ones that... Uh, fit the mold. Uh, we've talked before about how uh, being an entrepreneur is a bit of a sport. You know, we talk about how we're explaining that sport to other people through your show, through your book, or the investing side is a sport, right? These people are so much better at understanding that. You know, the people who haven't made it all the way through the incubator, and there have been a few. Yeah, um, two. They were the ones that, uh, and I took over one of their spots. That's how I got in the second yeah. time, right? Uh, they were the people who just didn't understand that the entrepreneurship thing is a game. There's something you need, there, there's a way you need to play it. But even the incubator itself from week to week, you have to iterate. You have to come back in with better examples. You have to come back in with a better story. And some people just- Better answers to the question. They don't want to play that game. They're going to they're gonna give the week one pitch in week five, and you're going to look at them and go, I'm not providing any value here. You're out. You yeah. know, it's not good. So, so iterating on your pitch, iterating on your product, keeping the two in sync over time, showing that growth. Um, some people are built for that, and you've gotten- way better at picking ones that are a uh, fit. Right. You have to take the work seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I've been working on with my team, myself, and mm -hmm. everybody around us, which is, hey, we are in a very privileged, unique position in the world. The world is changing rapidly because of technology. Mm -hmm. We are writing checks. We are accepting people into what I consider the Ellis Island of Silicon Valley. You come in here, you're from a different state, you're a different city, you're an outsider. Almost everybody in the industry here is an outsider, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception, I like to joke, of Tim Draper's kids, right. who were born, you know, there's very few people born into right. the business. The Conways and the Drapers. Conways and the exactly. Drapers. Right. And, and by the way, both sets of kids, delightful, intelligent, hardworking. Right. Successful. Successful. Right. Like, Investors, right. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here joking about right. it, but you can be sure my three daughters will be running mm -hmm. launch incubator right. if I the get third, my... The third family. It'll be the third, yeah, right. hopefully we'll be the Kennedys right. of this uh, whole thing. Nice. Um, 
the uh, interesting thing is you have to be serious about the work. And I, I, I sort of look at our job is we have to take our job of running the incubator more and more seriously because the impact it has on those people and the trickle down effect this technology has on society is very serious. Therefore, we have to stay serious. If we stay serious about it, they will be serious. Right. And if they get that sense that, hey, I take the work seriously, I need them to take the work seriously. So I give them all this big speech at the beginning. Hey, this is a unique opportunity for you. Take the work seriously, work hard, just give me 12 weeks of your life. And then afterwards, if you wanna take a break and you wanna go easy, you wanna you know, take it from fifth gear and running at 100% RPMs and running the engine hot, fine. You can slow down, you take a couple week break or you can go to half speed. But during this program, lean into it. Right. As Sheryl Sandberg would say, really, really lean into it and take the work seriously. And those who do, my God, it, you know, you look at Transporter, you look at Fitbod, they're doing mm -hmm. incredibly well. The, the investors who are looking at those companies and want to participate and the growth of the founders has been tremendous right. in these two examples. Yeah, no, I, I love them. And, and it's, two, it's two parts. It's the, both the pitch, but then also the Q&A. Mm -hmm. So we saw that today, uh, Alan from Fitbod gives great answers. Right. He's, he's really, uh, he did a really, really good job. Uh, and so that's, that's always fun to see how they've grown at handling those things. Because we talk about that sort of onstage judo mm. of somebody throws this at you, somebody throws that at you. How do you roll with these things? How do you give an answer that doesn't go on and on and on, right? And you right. watch them get better at that. And that is, you know, g giving the pitch is great, g doing great slides, explaining your product. But after that, that's, that's not gonna close an investor. The investor is going to challenge you with questions and if you survive that challenge, you get the you, meeting. You can keep going. But you if may you don't, get the if, meeting. If, if you don't survive that challenge, yeah, you know, you're not then you're get definitely the out, right? Yeah, you can out. definitely be. You can definitely lose it in the Q and A, or you can win the opportunity to continue the with discussion. that investor, right? Right. Um, so if you want to uh, apply to the incubator, it's pretty simple. Just type "launch incubator" into the uh, um, the uh, Google, mm -hmm. or you can email Jason at launch.co or Jackie or Ashley at launch.co and get more information mm -hmm. and join us in the incubator. It's uh, not easy. It's hard work. But you'll see over this three-episode arc that we're going to do on This Week in Startups where we interrogate and hear from mm -hmm. these eight companies, uh, I think you're going to really uh, learn to appreciate what they've accomplished mm -hmm. and the personal development and the professional development of of these founders. And we're we're really looking forward to the next class. And also, I'm really looking forward to uh, doing some uh, syndicates with you as yes. a new venture partner for the Launch Fund. So congrats on that. And Thanks. you can contact Brian Alvey on Twitter uh, or um, Brian at March 6com Correct. It's your birthday. It's my birthday. My wife. It's my wife's birthday. Yeah. March and the number six dot com. Correct. Did I just give out your personal email? Yeah, you did, but. You don't care. All the other email addresses I have. Go there. Go to that one. Right. So it just doesn't matter. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. And thanks again to our friends at Cisco for this amazing Spark board. It's been really transformative here in our office. We use it constantly. And uh, like I said, we're going to put them in a couple of different cities. So we're looking mm -hmm. for a partner who has, let's say, office space or co-working space in London, Korea, uh, New York, LA. So if you have a co-working space in one of those cities and you want to join us as a partner, uh, along with Cisco, to put a Cisco Spark board in your location and then have angel investors and startups uh, conference into the program, that's really what we're looking to do with these. And they have these incredible microphones and cameras inside of them. So Yeah, yeah we saw that uh, in South by Southwest right? yeah. uh, for the first time is what I, where I saw it. And then I heard there were, you were going to have them for these segments. Yeah. And I, I don't ever want to see you do a show that doesn't have one of them now. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's like a giant iPad yeah. with Slack or like a hip chat built in. So it's got a chat room built right. in, which people don't realize. The thing that I really love about it is when we use it here, um, when you're in that chat room, mm -hmm. you can dump a PDF or an image into it. Mm -hmm. And then if I want those people to be on a call with me at the board, Mm -hmm. I just say, throw this group onto the board and all of our documents from the group uh. are on the board. So if we said, hey, we're going to create one for launch incubator class number six, mm -hmm. we could have a, a chat room for them. They put their presentations in. The presentations are already on the board. Right. We no longer have to plug you in and, right. your, and your laptop in and you can just pull up any document, discuss it. Or if somebody was in the audience while you know, FitBot was presenting and wanted to throw a competitor's you know, sure, uh, pull up a website, website right. or something, or they, let's say you had a document about, you know, best practices for email, you could throw mm -hmm. that into the group and then 
uh, it would be in the chat room, would be on the spark board already. Nice. So this idea of like having to unplug and plug in or who can pull up their screen, it's just one giant chat room, one giant file repository. And it, and, and it's just, it's ridiculously clear. I can't make, there, there are no pixels to this. It's just, it's just crazy. It's so, it's, it's so clear. Yeah. I think, I don't want to speak for Cisco, but I think that this is like the future of the company. You know, they used to put, for the communication side, you know, they used to, people used to spend like whatever, quarter million dollars, half million dollars oh, yeah. building out Build a these, room. these rooms. Yeah. <laughs> you literally put one of these in for five grand or uh -huh. 10 grand or seven grand. It's different sizes. Uh -huh. And now you have one of those professional rooms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even for a, let's say you had a two city company. Right. Like five grand's nothing. You know, you pay five grand for all, two laptops. So mm -hmm. why not just get two of these, you know, right. or 10 grand for four laptops and a projector. Very useful. Very useful. All right, listen, thanks again to our friends at Cisco. Thanks Emmy Award winning producer Jackie and uh, Jake for making the uh, technical side of the program really, really crisp. I'm very proud of them. the uh, production. Yeah, I love them too. Not that much. I don't want to get raises going here. We say that. We gotta, uh, I, I can say whatever. There's still, things, <laughs> there's still things that need to be tweaked. I don't want anybody <laughs> coming to me for a raise until next year. All right, we'll see you next time on This Week in Star Wars. Bye-bye.